boys, fucking Russian man, fucking, fucking Russian man. What do you need cooler for? Fucking go flame. What the fuck are you doing? You fucking piece of shit. And really, why does everyone keep using the bloody term dead game? And in this video, we're going to be talking about Dota 2, its player count not doing so hot right now. It looks like the player count is at its lowest since uh, 2014. A definition. This is actually a sub-definition I need real quick. Um, player promises, you may have heard of them. I uh, consider them a game's essential experiences. Why did the player actually come to play this, right? What is the core of this game? And sometimes you give a player something really simple, just a few mechanics 
few systems, and then they immediately come to believe that the game owes them something in spe specific. And you kind of have to accept that. You have to deal with the fact that you've made this promise to a player whether, wet player, whether you meant to or not, and you have to adapt. So now that we've outlined what promises are, the cursed problem definition, it is an unsolvable design problem rooted in a conflict between core player promises. So it's basically any time I'm trying to solve a design problem and I have implicitly or explicitly promised two things that cannot coexist, it is surprisingly common. On the one hand, you want to have this cooperative experience. I want this like harmonious Ocean's Eleven feel where everybody's doing their own part. Like I'm the doctor and that means like I'm thinking doctor thoughts. You can't think my doctor thoughts for me, but it's a strategy game. So one person sort of can do the whole thing, right? We want to play to win. And the best way to play to win is actually centralized decision making, at least in a game like this. And that centralized decision making is fundamentally incompatible with the interdependence between players that's part of the fantasy of a co-op game. So even though this is a great game, it fundamentally kind of breaks its own promises. It is a cursed problem. And a lot of games like it are. One more for now, I call the skill inflation problem. So this occurs for evergreen competitive games, or PvP games you want to exist for many years. Games like this launch, and they are often awesome, they, you have an amazing time, you have all kinds of different players playing at different skill levels, but slowly as the game matures, the audience matures with it, right? And all the players get better and better, kind of in lockstep. And what's worse, the players who aren't getting better, they tend to leave. Maybe because they're not as invested, or because it's frustrating, and by the time you're years into one of these games, like, you may still have a great game, but it's very, very hard for new players to break in. Because all the players they see around them are incredibly good, they maybe have a hard time matchmaking with players at their level, and even they go online and they watch Twitch and everybody's good and they just feel like a total fraud. So this sucks, it's, we, this players, even an individual player, even a really serious player suffers from this. Because this player wants a long journey of mastery, they wanna be able to get better for like decades, but they also want a stable, vibrant community. They want players, you know, coming together and, uh, and playing together and new people coming in and they want to be able to play this for their whole life. These things are incompatible because a long journey of mastering naturally results in a rising skill pool. But a stable, vibrant community requires a, a broad variety of skill levels, right? These don't go together and it again is a cursed problem. So I'll talk about the co-op abuse problem. This sucks. Um, so high stakes co-op games often involve a lot of uh, terrible treatment between players. And I think, you know, as game developers, we have a responsibility to do what we can to make this better. And um, some of this, as Meg Giant so eloquently said yesterday, involves, uh, you know, telling the worst players, like the Nazis, to get the fuck out of our games. But there also is think we have a responsibility as designers as well to say like what can we do as our in our games to make these, this behavior less likely. Now unfortunately it feels like there's this fundamental incompatibility. Players want to play to win, right? That's these games signal themselves as, as sort of win oriented. But a lot of players also, they come for social belonging. The reason why you're playing a co-op game among others is because you want to feel like a part of something. And these two things, they often don't go well together because players who want to play to win will not be satisfied. Human beings uh, feel like a game is fair when they win 70% of the time. And that's probably not gonna happen in your PvP game. So if that player also is lacking um, anger management skills and tends to blame others more than themselves, you're gonna get them feeling dissatisfied and frustrated. The social belonging needing player wants psychological safety, needs it for that to happen. But these things don't go together. And, and I say sometimes here because it depends on the player, it depends on the player's state of mind. It feels like there's this fundamental tension in any co-op game that has high stakes, PvP or otherwise.
But slowly as the game matures, the audience matures with it, right? And all the players get better and better. And what's worse, the players who aren't getting better, they tend to leave. So, one of the properties here is there is no direct solution. One does not simply solve cursed problems. You have to instead, um, you have to work around it. You have to give something up. Like the Gordian knot, you kind of have to cut through the problem itself and, and find a kind of a strange non-solution. Lesson number one, fighting against human nature is a losing battle. Um, so they say in game design, you should know your audience. So our audience is human. Um, and they come with a complex operating system. Um, but while it's quirky, it is something that can be understood. There's an entire field of psychology trying to understand it. But as game designers, we have to be forewarned, humans can be a bit stubborn. So what I like to say to people is, don't change your players to match your game. Change your game to match your players. Don't get yourself into a fight that you're probably not going to win.
People will look to the actions of others to determine their own, just by proving that others have done it beforehand. This is an Im incredibly important thing and a really powerful tool. Now, if you're one of the few people now that are thinking it doesn't work on me, I'm way too smart for this. Well, let me tell you that subconscious or not, social proof is really powerful and has great impact on your decision. Several studies have shown that even if you think you're not influenced by social proof, your actions more often than not prove otherwise. So even those people that think they're not influenced by social proof, at the end of the day in the studies, they all were. Welcome to the International. Now, we all know what memes are, right? They're those things that we obsessively scroll through when we're meant to be doing that assignment that was due last week. But the real question is, are we aware of the true powers that they behold? Using memes to spread and manipulate ideas on a massive scale. Never in the history of men can powerful information travel so fast and so far. If the idea catches on, it can be said to propagate itself, spreading from brain to brain.